Welcome to Teen People, the podcast where I interview people who were in Teen People magazine. I'm Anna Soper, and I'm a visual artist and librarian in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. My guest in this episode is Sudani Del Valle, a school psychologist from New York. Sudani was 19 when she appeared in the Winter 2005 issue of Teen People, a special beauty issue. When Sudani was in her first year of college, she went back to her old high school to attend a graduation ceremony. There she was scouted by Amy Barnett, whose sister was graduating that year. Amy was Teen People's editor-in-chief and invited Sudani to come to Teen People's studios for a fashion shoot. Sudani appeared in a makeup tutorial featuring looks inspired by different decades from the 1920s onwards. She represented the 1980s and was styled as Madonna, wearing a lace headband, pink plastic hoop earrings, and lots of mascara. So I had my hair locked at the time. They crimped it a little bit and then they styled it in a way where like some of the hair was like coming, you know, over the front to kind of look like Madonna's um, like wavy curly hair in the front, like, you know, of the um, headband. So I thought that was pretty cool how they were able to style me because like, I mean, obviously like on the surface, I don't look like Madonna at all. Um, So it was just interesting. It was just really about the the fashion statement, I guess, and the style. You can see the photo on my Twitter and Instagram at teenpeoplepod. Sudani spoke with me about her career path, the next chapter in her life, and how she stays upbeat in tough times. sounds like you didn't have a very um, close connection to teen people or, or a very strong connection to teen people, but you bought a copy of the magazine and you've kept it for all of these years. What, what did teen people mean to you and what did it mean to you to see yourself in teen people? So I would say that um, I actually didn't, I don't think I bought any copies unless my family bought some, but after the photo shoot, they actually sent me some information. So they must have sent me some of the uh, magazines because I have several copies, but then they also sent me like where you can see kind of a touch up of the original image, which is interesting because, you know, if you look at the photo in the magazine, my top is black, but they edited it because it was actually blue. So there were, you know, there were just this, these different like marks that they put, you know, on my face just to edit it properly for the magazine. So that's interesting too, because I wasn't even aware that that was something that would be done. But on the day of the photo shoot, something that was really interesting is that I went to meet my mom afterwards and she was just shocked to see me because I had, I wasn't in high school, I didn't wear a lot of makeup and I had like a ton of makeup, but I think in order to get a certain image, um, Uh, whether that's on television or in a photo, like they actually go a little bit overboard with the makeup. (laughs) So it's like a lot, like it really thick. So when my mom saw me, she was like, whoa, like (laughs) she was like, it's a little scary to see with this makeup. In the magazine, it looks like normal, but I think in (laughs) in real life, it looks a little strange. But yeah, so I, I never really knew about all the different changes that would be made to an image. So that was, that part of the experience was interesting to me especially I think now uh, since people are moving away from so much editing, not that they did a lot to change how I look, they did it. But I think, um, you know, currently if you look at uh, a company like a Victoria's Secret where people used to be, like I guess all of the models had a particular look to them, very thin, like, you know, bigger breasts. And like now that they um, are moving away from that, they have women of all different sizes, not just women who are super thin. They are also trying to include women who have stretch marks, which is like a, a very much normal part of life. So I think it's, it was just, you know, this image kind of um, brings that up for me, just thinking about how um, editing might have changed over time and what uh, would be considered something that would be kept in or something that's like normal for just a human being. Because um, just even on my hand, they like, you know, wrote that they were smoothing the wrinkles in my hand, you know, so... Just things like that um, are very interesting to see. I don't know if that would matter now or, you know, if it, you know, would still have the same impact. But in terms of my experience with the magazine, it was definitely positive at the time. I really enjoyed it. And I think 
the most significant part for me is the fact that I am a woman of color, I'm black, and to be represented in a magazine, especially when I am, you know, a darker skinned woman uh, with natural hair, uh, for me, that was really significant, especially at the time I was attending a predominantly white high school, private high school. And um, so I was the only black girl in my class for the whole four years of high school. And not even just my class grade because it wasn't a particularly large school. So, um, you know, dating was challenging at that time or just like uh, I didn't necessarily represent the image of beauty um, that people were necessarily looking for in the media or, um, or just even in my day-to-day in my school environment. So people might say, oh, like, you know, oh, you're, you know, you're beautiful, you're pretty. But it was I was not like necessarily the girl that they were going to try to date because I didn't have like a lighter skin tone and a straighter hair. So for me, I think it was very validating to be seen and, uh, and chosen to represent a different um, demographic or a different image um, in this magazine at that time in my life where I don't think there were a lot of young black girls that looked like me that had that opportunity so I hope that any women, you know, who or girls who look like me um, might have felt the same way, like, you know, validated or represented um, and in a way which they typically weren't at that time. And yet they had you styled in the image of a white woman. And I'm, yeah. I'm wondering, could, could you reflect on that? How did that feel at the time? How does that feel now in light of, in light of how the conversation ar- around um, racial diversity has evolved in the past 15, 20 years? That is a good point. I definitely think that there are some icons that they could have chosen that are people of color or just black, you know, that I could have represented. But I think at the same time, since Madonna was like, you know, it was and still continues to be epic, I thought that that was um, pretty interesting that I could be Madonna um, and that they didn't really think that uh, the color of my skin or, you know, my race made a a difference in me being able to represent this iconic woman, um, you know, in, in the media and in the world. And so I think for me, too, that that was special that I wasn't necessarily put in a box like you can only be this person. I appreciated that too, that that didn't seem to matter to them because I, I even wrote like, I mean, I guess what I was saying is that, you know, because of my hair and, you know, I didn't think it was possible to make me look like Madonna, but they like kind of modernized this like 80s look and, you know, I was able to represent her. So I I appreciated that too, that I could be, I guess, anyone (laughs) at that time, you know, that they could make it work. Mm -hmm. Yes. There are two sides to that coin for sure. Yeah. If you could have chosen a celebrity to dress as for this shoot, what, who would you have chosen? Gosh, that is a really good question. I mean, I don't know. In terms of celebrities I really like, maybe I would have chosen like a, a Whitney Houston or someone like that. But there are a lot of um, icons from, I guess, back in that time period that I really, really liked. What were the sorts of things? It's interesting. It's it's really fascinating to me that you have not only the magazine, but you have the the original photograph with all of the marks ar- ar- around editing. You know, editing your mm. appearance for print. What are the sorts of things apart from the hand wrinkles, which I just think is like the <laughs> most ridiculous thing? Like you were nineteen <laughs> years old, and they were concerned about hand wrinkles. <laughs> yeah. What were yeah. the sorts of things that they said that they that they changed for publication? Yeah. So, so the biggest change was to the top that I was wearing, where they changed the color. Um, so I guess at that time they weren't really marketing a particular outfit. I mean, I think it was just like the styling that was the most important part so that I guess anyone who wanted to replicate the look could just use what they had in their wardrobe. But yeah, so the shirt was, the top was blue and they changed it to black. Maybe it was because I was on a blue background and maybe that was just too much blue. Um, Then they also, I guess there was a, because of a lighting issue, there was a contrast between the color of my face and my hand. And so my face was darker and my hand was lighter. So they said for the hand to like darken the skin a little and smooth the wrinkles. So I guess like any kind of little like, you know, bumps or pimples on the face, they like put like little blue dots on those areas to um, eliminate it. And actually it looks, and I'm wondering if they actually eliminated one thing. Like I have um, a beauty mark below my eye and I'm, it looks like they marked that as well to be removed. So let me go back and see if they actually took it out. Yeah, they did. So they removed the beauty mark from under my eye, uh, which is kind of interesting because I mean, I guess Madonna has like one, you know, the beauty mark that she puts like, you know, by her lips, but I have one under my eye and they removed that. That is interesting because now I think we sort of have a movement where there's been this kind of like 
minimal makeup or no makeup aesthetic in beauty yeah. in the last few years where you can see people's freckles and beauty marks mm -hmm. and wrinkles even. Yeah. What was the reaction when this issue of Teen People came out? What did the people around you have to say about it? Were they excited for you? Yes. I mean, my family especially was very excited. Um, so, you know, definitely they wanted copies of it. Um, my mom, you know, you know, still really proud of it. And I think uh, has even at some point in the past few years, like put the image on her Facebook. So, so you know, I, I mean, I think people were definitely excited that I was in this magazine. It was like my 15 seconds or 15 minutes of fame, I guess you could call it. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, there wasn't like a big reaction from my peers that I can recall, but more so like my family members were excited to see me in the magazine. So I took a look at your Instagram and um, I noticed you're smiling in like every picture and video <laughs> yeah. on your Instagram, which is really refreshing and really nice. Um, but one thing sort of jumped out at me and you, you wrote, if the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that tomorrow is not promised. Today mm -hmm. is the day to start making your dreams come true. Yes, yes. Um, and I still agree with that um, in terms of what I think might have inspired that particular post. Like, because I have I actually have two Instagram accounts. That is like the public one that I have because um, like I have a little bit of a coaching background even though I also have a day job that is very time consuming. So for, you know, I guess the past few months, the coaching part and even me updating that Instagram account has been on hold. Um, but when I was working on it, I was just thinking about um, the fact that, yeah, like, I mean, I think once we were in the pandemic, we just had no sense of when it was going to end and we still don't have a sense of when it's going to end. So I think anyone just putting things off and thinking about, okay, well, I'll just get to that later. Uh, we don't know if we're going to have that opportunity. And um, one of the things that I reflected on a lot during that time period, when we were more so in lockdown, because like now I'm actually back at work in person. And for um, a pretty much a whole year, I or even like a year and a half, because I went back briefly in that time period, like um, a year and a half, I was at home doing my work remotely. So I was uh, on my own quite often, like in, in my room with my laptop and you know whatever kind of technology. I was thinking about the fact that I've spent a long time focused on my career um, and just going to, you know, I guess going to college and then eventually going back to school, uh, grad school, and how I was focusing a lot of time and attention on career and that there were other parts of my life that I hadn't really gotten to. So I had always wanted to be a mom. And that's something that I, I knew from the, you know, from when I was really young, from when I was a child. And I'm also at this point, like, you know, this magazine is done when I was 19, but I'll be 37 next month. And so then I just started to become like kind of concerned about like fertility and the timing of um, attempting to become a, a mom or, you know, a parent and just thinking like, you know, I don't necessarily know what's going to happen tomorrow. Like, I hope that we'll all be okay, but, you know, do I still want to continue putting off uh, starting a family? Um, so. I had a lot of time to reflect, like lots of meditation, journaling, um, you know, I just think even uh, like exercising, all those things are really good for mental health. So I did a lot of that and had a really good routine during the pandemic. So when I was in quote unquote quarantine or work, working remotely, I never had that feeling of being like isolated or like, you know, lonely or, you know, traumatized in that way. Um, I felt like it was a, almost like being in a, a retreat, so to speak. So like if I was in like the mountains somewhere and I had this opportunity to really reflect and um, go more internal uh, and to sit with my own thoughts and feelings. So I had a lot of time for that. And, um, you know, I decided that, OK, you know, I can keep waiting to have a child, but I didn't want it to get to the point where I wouldn't be able to conceive um, so I just kind of went ahead with that. And so I am pregnant now, 18 weeks pregnant, which was very exciting. Um, and that journey was a little bit tough in and of itself, you know, maybe because of my age, maybe for other reasons, but, um, I'm glad it all worked out. You know, I still have a ways to go in the pregnancy, but that I would say that that quote from my Instagram probably had something to do with, um, that backstory in my life or what's going on at this point. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah. That's deep. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, when is your baby due? 
uh, June 25th. Oh, a summer yeah. baby. <laughs> yes. And I'm a winter baby. So I'm, I'm all for this baby coming in the summer. <laughs> like it'll be a bit nicer, more <laughs> opportunities to be out and to sell it. Like we can celebrate the birthday outside. So that would be nice too. And some yes. summer activities. <laughs> yes. I was born in July. And so oh. I, I never had the experience of having to be in school on my birthday. Oh, that's so nice. <laughs> and, until I was in university and then I took a summer course. <laughs> oh, yeah. But it was fine. It was it, like that summer course was so chill and I was there with good friends and a good prof. So it, that was a, a nice, even though I had to be in class on my birthday that year, it was, it was nice. But um, yeah, I hear you on that. Do you have a name picked or are you, you at that, not at that stage yet? No, not yet. Um, I'm more in the stage of, um, I guess, preparing in other ways. Like, you know, I have my baby registry ready for the most part. Um, like a friend of mine wants to throw a baby shower. And because of the pandemic, we we're trying to think about like how we go about that. And since I recently got COVID and um, she, like my friend is you know, very concerned about getting COVID herself. Um, you know, I was just telling her, I thought that probably having a, a virtual baby shower in the meantime would be better, um, because I don't think it'll be quite warm enough, uh, where I live to have a baby shower outside. Um, but I was saying that we could probably have like a sip and see like in July or August in the park and have a picnic, um, or more so like a barbecue. So we wouldn't have to be worried about the venue or anyone getting sick indoors. We could be outside. Um, so that, that's kind of what I'm the mode that I'm in now, just thinking about like what I need for the baby, like what things I want to um, set up in advance so that things are um, prepared when that time comes. And because I, I've read and like doctors say that the second trimester is the time when women have uh, the most energy. So there's like a dip in energy in the first trimester, a dip in energy again in the third. So it's like, okay, now this is my window to really be busy and getting things done while I still can, and then, you know, while, while I can do things on my own. I don't know how often it's discussed, like the the limits to fertility. I think perhaps from just seeing what goes on in the media that some women may think that like, oh, you know, I can just focus on my career, focus on my career. And I, I have time, like I'll get around to that some other time. Just um, one example I'm thinking of is like Naomi Campbell, like at 50, having her first child. And, you know, I, I don't know if it's just because of a stigma that celebrity moms may not want to talk about their private lives and I understand that I'm someone who like you know at certain times there are things I want to share you don't want to share um but we you know there's kind of like a mystique around it we don't really know how she had a child at 50 right and so I think for some other people who might not have a lot of information about fertility and how it works they might think okay well you know when I'm 50 I'll, I'll just have a kid when I'm 50 and that that's not always you know an option like not unless people plan ahead for it so it was always at the front, the forefront of my mind, because I, I also have seen women online who are really saddened when it gets to a point where they are ready and they want to try and it's not working out. Um, and that can be devastating as well. So I, I was like, OK, I, I better get a move on. Like I, because it's also unpredictable. It's not like every woman who, like you know, I'm 36 going on 37. It's not like every woman who's 36, you know, going on 37 has the same like fertility that I do. It really varies for so many reasons, whether that's, you know, people's genes, the environment, so many factors come into play. So there isn't even really like a one-to-one -one comparison on that. Um, so I think it is really hard if it like works out for one person and might not work out for someone else who's like, yeah, I easily had a child at 42. And for someone else, that might not be an option. Um, so I definitely, I wish that uh, these conversations would be had more. Like I'm even thinking about like sex ed classes that we had. I think, you know, the emphasis is like, you know, don't get a you know a disease, don't get pregnant, you know, these are the precautionary measures. But I don't even think that there's a lot of information that's provided on like reproductive health or anything like that um, in that time period. Definitely not like I think most of the things I've learned, you just like search it on the internet or maybe have a conversation with um, a physician. But Otherwise, it's just not widely available to my knowledge that people would know, like, you know, be taught in school, like that these are things to think about as you um, go down your path. Like you can, you definitely can have both. You can have, you know, an amazing career, but you can also have a family if that's something that you want, but you just need to plan ahead for it. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's yeah. interesting that you say that, because I think that there's been a conversation in the last few years about menopause, like that mm -hmm. menopause has not been discussed. And yeah, so- not at all. It's it's interesting that that here you are with, with your perspective and you're saying oh well fertility has not been discussed no 
you know mm, so I well, think people are just shocked later they're like oh like I it's not going to be easy you know at this time it's like it, it's not it gets harder and harder with age yeah yes Yes. Well, good for you for taking the initiative when you realized you had that urge. And I I do think that the pandemic has brought some things into focus for a lot of people about what's really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I've spoken with several people on this podcast who are just so optimistic, despite everything that we're living through Mm. now. And I'm curious, what makes you so optimistic? Oh, well, wow, that's such a good question. Um, I think during the pandemic, I um, spent a lot of time learning too about like law of attraction and manifestation. And so that was really interesting to me because it, it ties into psychology a lot, just mindset. If we're thinking of like cognitive behavioral therapy and like, you know, how our thoughts kind of create our reality. Uh, so I think just those different points of view or like, you know, perspectives or theories just really help me to think ahead and to believe that there that there is a possibility for there to be a better future. But I think it also begins with, um, you know, my thoughts and my perspective on life. So I did notice because there was a time period during work, like prior to the pandemic, where I was really, really stressed, um, very overwhelmed and anxious all the time at work. And I almost felt like I was attracting more <laughs> negative situations because of me always anticipating something bad happening because of like stress and anxiety. It takes a lot of effort. And I'm not saying I'm perfect. Like I feel like I'm already backsliding, but there was a period of time when I was working from home where I started to overcome those um, anxious feelings and thoughts and like projections. And I started to be able to project something better or to trust that there could be something positive coming my way. So I, I do think our our thoughts create our circumstances to a certain um, extent. And so maybe that's why I'm optimistic that I, I know that we have the potential within ourselves to create a, a better current situation and a better future. I think you're part of that trend. I think there's been a lot of discussion. Um, I've, I see this on Twitter, on YouTube, um, on TikTok, a lot of discussion about manifestation right now because there are so many things that are outside of our control it does Mm -hmm. feel really empowering to say well at least I can control my own thoughts yes absolutely what led you to become a school psychologist Mm, well I grew up in a low-income community um, and I also you know I started off in a public school in my neighborhood uh, for elementary school through third grade, there were two different schools I attended. And um, then there was a period of time where my mom looked into sending me to like a better school because she wasn't um, happy with the education that I was receiving in the public schools in my neighborhood. Um, so she, you know, applied and we did our interviews and kind of testing that was necessary. And I was able to get into um, a private school in Manhattan on like a sliding scale fee, I guess having seen that contrast about what was available in the public school system in my uh, lower income neighborhood versus like what uh, was available to children in like a, a you know more upscale neighborhood with more resources that was something that really inspired me uh, to become a school psychologist because i figured that i would be able to provide cer- certain types of um, quality services to children that they might not have otherwise had access to initially i was more interested in more of like the, the counseling aspect but then I also be through my training and my program also became more interested in the um, academic portion of it, which is like psychoeducational assessment. So I don't know, like, I think people don't really know what a school psychologist is oftentimes. Um, and so they think that, oh, you're like a guidance counselor or like, you know, they just don't really, you're a social worker. You're, or oftentimes some of my family members would be like, oh, so you're a teacher, right? I'm like, no, I'm, I'm not a teacher. So nobody really knows what it is that I do. But like school psychologists, at least in the public school system, typically work with children who have special needs. So children who are receiving special education services. So we will do assessments to see if a child uh, who is struggling academically or, you know, social, emotionally, behaviorally, if they, we will do assessments to see if they qualify for special education services, if they need that kind of support in school. And actually, I work in the, like, currently in the district um, that I vote in. Uh, So I guess I'm playing a significant role at this time um, in my community in the way that I wanted to. 
Uh, I won't say that it's easy. It's very hard. <laughs> and I think I was really idealistic going into it, thinking I was going to just, you know, make these big, um, this big impact. But, you know, there, there are a lot of systemic changes that have to happen in order for us to be able to make more um, of a difference on a micro level. There were times where I thought, you know, maybe in the future, because I, I am still like working on, on my doctorate, that like in the future I would do something in private practice. But um, so now that I'm in the school system and I did during my um, graduate training have an opportunity to do like private evaluation through because we had a, a licensed psychologist who kind of oversaw our, our work there. So we as trainees were able to do these private evaluations. But when I reflect on that experience versus being in the school system, I realize that in these communities, like a lot of parents are not, they don't get the opportunity to choose who's doing these assessments for their child or, you know, get to choose like who's seeing their child for counseling, et cetera. And um, so even though like I may have come into this environment with the best intentions, like I just, you know, I want to make a difference. I want to help these families. Um, I, because of the system that I work for, I don't think that I'm always seen, seen as an ally. Uh, and I think sometimes I'm seen as uh, the end, like being a part of the system or an enemy because there'll be parents that are like threatening with like, I'm getting an educational advocate, like, you know, I'm getting a lawyer and they're just like, you know, so angry. But, you know, when, when I got into this work, I really wanted to make a difference because um, one of the things that I don't, I don't know if it's widely known, but students of color and especially like um, Latin, Black and Latinx students and boys of color are disproportionately referred for special education services. So to a certain extent, I do try to be a gatekeeper with that. And I, I work with an older population. So a lot of the students are already classified for special education. But for initial cases, I try as much as possible to be mindful and to try to avoid um, classifying students that, you know, could get support in other ways or maybe, you know, it would be an inappropriate recommendation. But I think when I maybe try to, like, move parents in the opposite direction of, like, least restrictive environment for your child, like, you know, let's try to keep your child um, with a, in, within a more diverse um, environment, but, you know, still give them the services that they need or I might say like, no, I don't really think your child is eligible. Like, you know, let's try something else. So that, that's something since um, returning to work in person, it's been kind of a major issue where I was like, wow, you know, I'm, I'm here thinking I'm like helping, but I don't know if the people I work with really see it that way all the time. Yes, I, I think that's really interesting to hear you say that because um, it seems to be like there's a pattern right now of mistrust of professionalized and authority figures yeah. And I see this as a librarian. I'm watching what's happening in the United States, the conversation around, you know, policing library collections and policing librarians and potentially even incarcerating librarians yeah. um, who, yeah. you know, provide access to materials that the parents are, you know, upset about for various reasons. Um, mm -hmm. So it's disappointing to hear that you're you're experiencing that same kind of pushback that, you know, people are mistrustful of of your profession and, and your motivations as a professional. Yep, definitely. It's been really hard to cope with. But again, I think all those other things I was talking about, like mindset and like really trying not to take things personally and trying to understand where the other person is coming from. So I try as much as possible, even though sometimes it feels like personal, like, you know, it's towards me, sometimes it hurts. Um, try to remember that it's not really a, about me, right? It's about them. It's about their child. And, um, you know, sometimes parents just want the best for their, their child and they think that they know, you know, what's best all the time. Maybe yeah, I would say that oftentimes they do. Uh, but I think that there is a different perspective or like, you know, training that I have or information that could be helpful. I think grappling with that has been really challenging this year because I'm like, well, I'm not, I'm not an adversary, but I guess some people don't believe that and even if I have like you know a situation with parents which again this year is the first time I've had like a more negativity with like you know a parent hanging up on me and like in mid-conversation and things like that but as a school psychologist I always feel like it's my responsibility to um to start over each day and so like even if a child has done something that was offensive or like you know like disrespectful the day before I'm not going to come in with a, a grudge the next day and, and, you know, hold it against them. So I kind of try to have the same attitude with the parents. Like, even if a parent like, you know, curses at me, like hangs up, like I try the next time we have a conversation to start over and, and to let it go. <laughs> if you weren't a school psychologist, what would you like to be doing instead? 
Ooh, I love this question because <laughs> I've been thinking about that too. Um, even though I don't even know if I would like want to spend more money on education. So I'm like, how could I do, you know, do these other things without that? Uh, so coaching, I really like, like life coaching. Um, but aside from that, the other uh, areas that I'm interested in include interior design and like baking. Um, baking is more realistic because I actually do like, I would say do something where I'm like baking at least once a week. It's kind of therapeutic for me to be in the kitchen and try new recipes. So that's something I've even enjoyed as a kid. Like I remember being in high school and like making cheesecakes. I love, um, that creative outlet. I would love to be able to have a, a more creative career. The arts have always kind of been a part of my life, but I definitely think this would be an opportunity for me to, to be creative, which I would love. And also, I just love baked goods and they just taste so yummy. Mm, well, I hope you can manifest that for yourself. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Gosh, yeah. Or just even thinking of like, you know, Anthony Bourdain or just someone who gets to be like, you know, around the world, just like traveling, like, and yes. working with food or like a Samin Nosra. Like, I just think what they have done is very interesting and fun and cool. I read on your blog that when you were in school, you were asked to write a letter to yourself, which you received oh, years later as you graduated. Do you remember what you wrote to yourself? Not anymore, because I've actually since then written other letters to myself. I don't know which letter I was talking about there. It could have been for grad school, because I, I do believe we did that activity for high school as well. Um, but for grad school, I just remember writing... Um, you know, information that I had received from other people, like, you know, affirmations and things that they had said that were very positive about me. And then also just trying to encourage myself um, to be confident because going into grad school, and I think I'm even still <laughs> dealing with it now since it's taking me forever to finish my doctorate. <laughs> but, um, you know, in the letter, I was trying to encourage myself because be before I even got started, I was, again, like this, this uh, ongoing, like anxiety and worry thing. <laughs> That's like a theme for me. Um, I was worried before I even applied to grad school um, about like taking the GRE, like how was I going to do on this exam and like the dissertation, like how am I going to write one? It just seems like such a big undertaking. Uh, so in this letter, I was just trying to encourage myself um, and to think about all of the strengths that I have and all the people that support me in life and what the, you know, the potential outcome would be of me getting through my program would be, you know, like what, what my goals were. So I remember that being the content. So just like encouragement and then also thinking about the benefits of making it uh, to the end. So I, I remember that being the main part of the letter. Mm. Yeah. I think that's really smart. Like centering your goals mm -hmm. to remind yourself, why, why am I doing this? Exactly. Because you can lose sight of that. Like, you know, you forget the reason why you even started in the first place. Similarly, I was wondering what advice would you give your 19 year old self today? Oh, man. I think I would give my 19 year old self the advice to take more risks, I think, and to explore more. Um, I think that there are ways in which I can be a perfectionist and, you know, want to go down a particular path, do the right thing. So I was uh, learning a lot about entrepreneurship and um, there was this podcast called uh, Entrepreneur on Fire. And I think it, you know, it still exists, but I started listening to a lot of those episodes and I would go for runs and I would listen to like John Lee Dumas, um, you know, and he, he would interview all these different entrepreneurs. And it was interesting to hear all these stories about people who took a chance and did something a little bit different. I think we're all like encouraged to uh, like, you know, finish high school, go to college, like that, that's the path to success, like get a college degree. And not that I disagree with that, but I do think sometimes in, you know, even with the children or the, you know, the young people that I work with, that this path towards like pushing everyone towards college where that might not always be for them is not ideal. Like I think that there are other trades or, um, you know, vocational skills that people can learn or like, you know, like even just speaking to you now about me being like interested in the culinary world and baking, like, you know, you know, you don't necessarily need to go to college to do something like that. So I wish that there was just more of um, a discussion about other pathways that students could take. And I think that there, I wish I'd, I'd had more of um, someone in, in my life who would have showed me that there are these different pathways that I could have taken. Because I think that for me, I would have been interested in potentially branching out on my own and, and trying to do some things on my own. Um, like, you know, potentially like the coaching, for example, or maybe, you know, trying out a culinary school. 
uh, realizing that there are these other creative outlets that I could have um, tried before getting like too entrenched and too deep in, in too deep into like what I'm in now. Cause I think, you know, now like I have like student loan debt, there are all these other factors, right. That come into play that make it a little bit um, more challenging to just be like, okay, I'm just going to like give up everything right now and like, you know, go do what I want to do. I feel like there are a lot of responsibilities that I have in terms of bills and it's, it's not quite as easy, but back then as a 19 year old, I definitely think it would have been easier to have that flexibility to just, try something and maybe, you know, fail at it um, and then pick myself back up. I think too, also conversations about failure would have been helpful because I think that like some of us are like, you know, failure avoid avoiders. Like I, you know, I don't want to fail at anything. I just want to be like great at everything and perfect at everything. But sometimes having those opportunities to fall and, and, you know, see that things are not perfect, but even if it doesn't work out this time, like I've learned something new that I can apply to, um, you know, the next opportunity I have to try something and I'll just get better through my practice. Um, I think there was just such an emphasis on like perfectionism for me that I, I didn't really value those opportunities to fail and to grow. So even now, like I still, I still struggle. Like if something doesn't go perfectly, even though I feel like I tried my best to work on it, to, to have the best outcome. And then there is some type of failure and it still bothers me, but I think now I'm able to see, okay, well, that didn't work out the way that I wanted to. And it feels bad in this moment, but I know that the next time that this similar situation arises, I'm going to be able to overcome it because I've gained all these new skills. I have all this new information that I can apply to the next time. So I wish I knew these kind of kinds of things when I was 19, I think it would have been really helpful. And I think I would have had, um, I don't know, more, more fun. Thanks for listening to this episode of Teen People. I'm back next week with the last episode of this season. I talk with Dr. Ben Berry, Dean of Fashion at Parsons School of Design. He spoke with me about the Teenage Passion Project that launched him onto Teen People's list of teens who will change the world. But having a community that was like, yes, we believe in this. We think this is important. This needs to happen. And we're going to, quote, take the risk. We're going to feature you on the news. We're going to create dialogue and exposure for you. It was because of that community support that this even happened. So then going to New York for Teen People and having kind of that extended support, I think it's just really just makes you value like the role of community um, when you're doing anything in life. Find out how Ben is changing the world on the next episode of Teen People podcast. Until then, I'm Anna Soper. Stay well. Thank you.